right. Hi. Hello. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight um, for our conversation with Holly Parker, Ingen Miller Jorgensen, and Alice Jones. Um, our exhibit here at the UNE Art Gallery in Biddeford, Bright Horizons in UNE North, features the paintings of Ingen and Alice, as well as the work of Diana Furukawa and Adele McFarlane Weil. These artists represent experience living and working across the North Atlantic, including in Scandinavia, Southern Maine, Down East Maine, and the Canadian Maritimes. Bright Horizons was organized by the UNE Art Galleries in collaboration with UNE North, and we're happy to be joined today by UNE North Director Holly Parker. This has been a wonderful opportunity to work together to build a story about the special creative qualities of our region and how our lives are influenced by our, our environment. Um, along with the artwork, the exhibit features reflections from our university communities in the UNE North and Division of Library Services on the importance of place. So um, first I'm going to introduce our guests and then we can start. Um, Holly Parker is the director of UNE North. She holds a PhD in public policy from the Muskie School of Public Service at USM. And she's known at UNE for her creative, engaging, and innovative approach to forming connections across the university, the Portland area, and the North Atlantic region. Alice Jones is um, a painter based in Maine who holds a degree in visual art from Bowdoin College. She's a co-director of New System Exhibitions in Portland, and she shows her work at Elizabeth Moss Gallery. Her paintings are notable for the way in which they combine landscape-based subject matter with a sense of mark making and storytelling. And Ingen Milla Jorgensen, hi, um, <laughs> is a painter who is originally from Norway and is now based in Kennebunkport. Um, her paintings have been recognized for their connection to the domestic landscape and are known for their sense of tranquility and anticipation. Ingen's intriguing use of gold leaf adds a dimension of history and materiality to her work. So um, to start our conversation, I would just like to go around and ask you each very quickly to just talk about your sense of place um, as you see it. So why don't you start, Holly? Hi. Um, first, Hillary, thank you so much for the collaboration on this project. This has been uh, a wonderful uh, way for UNE North to grow and expand its reach through the arts and humanities in our work for sustainable development here in Maine and throughout the North Atlantic and into the Arctic. Um, and it's been a thrill for me as the daughter of an artist to finally get to work on a gallery show. Uh, it's been really fun, so thank you. Um, my sense of place is really driven, frankly, by the ocean. Um, I am very much a water woman. Uh, and, and when I came to Maine 12 years ago, I had already spent my childhood coming here every single summer. And I knew from very early on that this would be my home. And before it was even my home, it was my home. And so uh, I get that special feeling when I drive across the bridge in Portsmouth, where it's just like all the tension just drops away and you feel like you can, all the senses come alive. Whether I can actually smell the ocean or not as I'm coming through Kittery, I can smell the ocean. I can, <laughs> I can feel all the feelings, I can feel fog, I can feel saltiness. Um, and so when I moved to Maine um, 12 years ago, I was still teaching, um, and so I needed uh, several side hustles on that. Uh, I was teaching high school English, and I was sailing full-time uh, for schooners, uh, several schooner companies up in Portland. And that was my first introduction to Casco Bay. Um, I'd never sailed Casco Bay before, and I was spending 10 hours a day, five days a week on those waters, uh, really dependent on the wind uh, to move us, the currents to move us through that bay. And I just deeply fell in love uh, with that place. And so uh, I have felt at home in many places in the world, but I've never felt so embraced and loved by a place as I do uh, by my home here in Maine. So there's my sense of place. Thank you. <laughs> Um, for me, I think I form a sense of place through kind of these like personal connections I form with whatever landscape I'm currently in. Um, I'm not originally from Maine, I'm originally from Tennessee, but regardless of, and I've lived other places as well, but regardless of where I've, you know, living at the time, um, I think I have been able to always form a sense of place it's something that's really important to me through forming these like personal connections just by like 
going out into the landscape, um, taking walks, runs, um, hiking, canoeing, whatever, um, but just like spending time outside and just observing and um, yeah, finding these moments where I'm caught in something, there's some feeling that comes from it. Um, and that drives a lot of just my sense of groundedness in a place. And um, it's something I also get from painting. It's almost like a meditation. Um, and yeah, it helps me connect with a place and just learn and be quiet and um, yeah, listen. So. Thank you. Um, I think I'm very much like you. Um, it's a sense of connection. Um, I have a very busy brain, <laughs> so I need to go out and reconnect and feel grounded and just breathe. Um, and that can be, I mean, you said you were an ocean girl. Mm -hmm. I'm a meadow girl. <laughs> <laughs> I need my meadows also because I'm, I love flowers. Uh, but it can be the woods, it can be a mountain, it could be the shoreline. I walk miles in the woods every day to try and find grounded again. Um, but then also, it could be my own garden. Um, we're lucky we have a huge garden. I grow most of what we eat. We raise chickens, we have animals. Mm. Um, so just be in all of that we have created with my tribe. That's also mm. just a great sense of place for me. Mm. That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's really interesting to me how um, what you're saying, and Ginnan, what you're saying, Alice, um, really reminds me of the kind of work that you make, like these very mm -hmm. distinct bodies of work. I feel like Inga and yours revolve so much around this kind of idea of home and how like this bigger landscape and bigger world can hold the home. Mm -hmm. And Alice has a more kind of cosmic sensibility that seems kind of like it's kind of like shooting off in all these directions, <laughs> um, past and future. So yeah, it's really, I think that's really fascinating. Um, and then, you know, of course, Holly, we expect you to be going back and forth across the ocean all the time. So that makes perfect sense, too. Um, so just to start off with a question, um, to me, one of the really intriguing things about the North Atlantic region um, is how many distinct nations and geographies it encompasses, along with the attendant diversity in terms of specific histories and cultures. Um, Personally, I have had experience traveling across northern New England um, in the Maritimes and in Quebec, and to a lesser extent in England and Russia. Um, so that's kind of my experience with this region. But I would love to hear from each of you about how your experiences across different parts of the North Atlantic region um, have unfolded and how or if your travel has influenced your understanding of this, this wide area. So you are right, I do get to travel for my job, not as much in the last two years, but um, I do have the privilege of being able to, to travel through the North Atlantic and into the Arctic. And so I think the place that has, has resonated most for me, and I've said if there's any place, if, if somebody kicked me out of Maine and I had to go live somewhere else, I would live in Iceland. And um, there is what was so disorienting, I, I've never felt so disoriented and welcomed by a place at the exact same moment. Uh, I went there first time in, in 2015. Uh, I attend a conference, an annual conference there every October. And you arrive at Keflavik Airport and you take the sky bus in from Keflavik to, to Reykjavik. And you, you go across these lava fields that look absolutely otherworldly, particularly to a woman from New England. This, th we don't do volcanoes here. And so to go across these amazing lava fields and be so excited and, 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 and enraptured by this place. And then you arrive in Reykjavik, which feels like Portland. And so it's disorienting and absolutely welcoming at the same time. There's familiar and the unfamiliar. And so there was such an opportunity to learn, but also to kind of feel welcome at the same time. And so that was incredibly inspiring to me. Um, I've also been to Norway, um, Tromsø, Norway. I got above the Arctic Circle for the first time there, and that was incredible. Uh, saw my northern lights, and, and again, found these communities that, I, and I think this is, 
what I have found as a common thread in my work in the North is that there is an ingenuity, an innovation, um, and a respect for different ways of knowing and seeing um, in the North that I find incredibly energizing. So when we think of uh, the North, we think of our, our Scandinavian cultures, we think of our main, you know, crusty main culture here. Uh, we think of the indigenous peoples of the North and, and how are they being voiced in, in, these, different, in these different spaces. Um, how are our indigenous Mainers and New Englanders being voiced here? So we see these similar tensions and themes that can be really inspiring for partnership. And that, that is, as, as Hillary indicated before, that, that's my jam. I love building partnerships and teams. And so that has been really amazing to me. And, and that lived experience of place, I think, is where you start. You know, where we start when we think about sustainability. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I have not really traveled much in the, in the North Atlantic region outside of Maine. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm from the South. Um, and so Maine to me was, is this kind of exploration. Um, and while I'm not traveling, because I do like have a home, I do uh, travel within the state. And that just always feels like an exploration, whether I'm in Portland or going up north or west. Um, yeah, I think just I'm. Tennessee is a landlocked state, so experiencing the ocean, as you talked about, it's such a wonderful thing that I just had not been around before. Um, and just like watching, going to the coast and seeing how it changes in the seasons and various types of weather, I can just spend all my time there. And that's just a completely new, it's full of learning. It's not an experience I've really had before. Um, the woods are completely different. Um, like eastern boreal forest first the deciduous forest down south um, I feel like I'm constantly learning just the various ecologies and the histories here they're so different so uh, it definitely informs my work the seasons too like snow winter just kind of desolate landscapes things being barren at any point like that's just is not what I'm used to so um, yeah, I think it's definitely informed my work and influences that um, in that way and that like I'm, these landscapes are exciting to me and that I'm learning from them and also like learning my own familiarity, like gaining familiarity with this landscape and as the seasons go by and these different places that I occupy. Um, yeah. Say to that is just um, you know you're bringing up the, the really important point, which is that even within smaller areas, there's so much difference in terms of what the land is offering, um, in terms of perspective. You know, southern Maine is very very different from northern Maine. Um, sort of mid coast Maine is very different from down east Maine, um, and I think that you know that must be the case across these other regions of the North Atlantic as well. Um, and it's just fascinating for me to think about like how these um, variations unroll from place to place. And you know, what we're really talking about here is something very big and something that's, you know, it's offering something that just continues to unfold. And I like how you're talking about, you know, allowing your imagination to move within the smaller area and still, you know, finding specificity and finding, you know, the things that are new that speak to you in a different way. Um, yeah. That's really wonderful. Absolutely. I mean, things are always, always changing and always evolving. So, like, I love revisiting places. I'll have, you know, I like going totally new places, but also I have, a, you know, a handful of places I like going every day or every couple of days. And, it's always, everything's always different. I think yeah. that's, there's something really great to that is um, can't ever really get too comfortable. Uh, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. But also, <laughs> you know, you can build that comfort as you go over time, but also things will always be different. So I think just having both, both sides of that um, is something that's very, like, informing and motivating uh, and important. It's just an important part of my life incorporate yeah. yeah and if you're intentional about it you can find those differences you know I, I was just talking to a friend recently about how the the sort of the way that the trees look in down east Maine like around East Porter Lubeck like they have this kind of like blue moss all over them mm. and um, 
they just have a different shape and they inhabit their space differently. And then, you know, the trees that would be sort of like in the Western mountains are totally different. They're just doing something else. They have like, they're kind of more expansive. They have a warmer color temperature. They smell different. So, you know, there are all these examples of how that, um, you know, that kind of variation that you're talking about works. So, yeah, thank you. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so I traveled, you know, clearly around Sc well, the Scandinavian countries, um, England, um, Iceland, and then in 07, we were offered a position, or my husband, he was the reason we moved here. <laughs> and I thought, okay, because <laughs> we all have this stereotype, you know, the U.S., ooh, noisy, and how's this, <laughs> you know, the seeker of <laughs> silence, how's this all going to work out? Um, and I didn't really know a lot about Maine, other than I had read the Cider House rules, of course. <laughs> um, so we packed up, um, moved over, and, you know, <laughs> first morning, I everyone was jet-lagged asleep, and I thought, okay, um, I'm going to grab the dog and go for a walk. And I found a trail, like, next to my house, and I just followed this trail, and it led me to a river. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is looking really good. <laughs> And then there were two old gents on the other side of the river, like, hey, are you this Italian lady? No, I'm the Norwegian. <laughs> okay. And later I got to know that there was an Italian. So I thought, okay, I can, mm -hmm. I can do this. Yeah. And then I found out that Maine, you know, we're just supposed to stay for two years. And then the kids moved and we're still here. So clearly I have found a lot of elements that I'm embracing, um, the nature, the people, um, I found out that very similar to Scandinavian mentality, mm -hmm. um, both nature and people's energy. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So you're finding real similarities between these very, very different places. I do. Yeah. I do. That's um, amazing. Well, it's really um, cool to hear Alice talking about this like bifurcated view of nature within this very small geographic range. And you're talking about this real connection between <laughs> continents. I love that. Yeah. But I'm with you because I, you know, I love my own backyard. I have to be pulled out of my own house. <laughs> I walk in the same woods. Mm -hmm. um, and there's always something new, right? You don't have to do the big stuff right. to find inspiration. Well, I do think that Norway and Maine are kind of famously similar in some ways. I read something that Karl Ova Knausgaard had written about how um, the place that he could imagine visiting in the United States kind of first and most easily would be Maine. Mm -hmm. And he, I, th I think he like had published something in um, the New York Times supplement, and he said he was talking all about how he planned to go to Maine, and <laughs> it was going to happen, and then it didn't happen, and he was so frustrated because he... Whenever he saw a picture of it, he thought, oh, I recognize that place. This is going to be easy enough. And he ended up in Newfoundland, uh -huh. which is a really interesting, you know, other part of this region that's completely different from, from here, right? Um, I just find Maine more and more intriguing. The longer I live here, the more fascinated I am. <laughs> now, have you traveled a lot around the state of Maine, Ingen? Um a little, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> a little? Yeah. yeah. You know, the coastline all the way up and down, of course. And um, I used to jump in my car and just drive around and look for barns, mm -hmm. um, clearly, because I do painting. Yeah. Um, and then I just, you know, I stopped. I rang the doorbell, uh, which led to amazing conversations yeah. that became as important as actually painting the barn with all these conversations with the owners about. Do you, you know, mean you actually went to, you saw a beautiful barn and you went to find the owner of the barn to talk to them about it? Yeah. I just That's so in wonderful. And I, <laughs> and I hope I will <laughs> be welcomed. And it led to just the most amazing conversations for hours often, you know, where they told me about the farm, the hardship, the work, the, mm -hmm. all the beauty of it. That's great. Well, and yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense, too, with your work, because there's such a sense of the way that vernacular architecture intersects with, you know, this kind of coastal world mm -hmm. where the water is kind of coming and going, and, you know, the, the buildings are functioning as these um, 
kind of characters in this mm -hmm. unfolding story. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, cool. All right, thanks. <laughs> so this is a related question. I would love to know um, about how this experience of place and environment um, influences your creative process. You've talked a little bit, Ingen, about meeting people and making connections. You've talked about making kind of maybe more spiritual, lateral connections in nature. Um, and of course, Holly has um, a large project of building connections with people. But how, you know, how you're, the way that you sink into a place and perceive it really uh, influences your, your creative process and how this um, influences how you build a sense of narrative and story in your artwork and other professional endeavors. Because I feel, Holly, like you're a kind of artist as well. Um, well thank you. Of course. Um, <laughs> and I also want to ask, added on to that, um, how you feel that your work might be different outside of this region. Um, what do you think might change in your work, or what might stay the same? So I think one of the things that's um, evolved for me since I, I started this work, and I, and I started working with the North Atlantic and Arctic issues around 2015, um, one of the things that has changed, and this is thanks to a great colleague of mine, um, Glenn Page, uh, who, who runs a company called Sustainometrics, and we've been doing work together um, on looking at the world through bioregions as opposed to saying a state or a town or a human-built uh, boundary. And by saying what is the earth or the environment showing us as being a related area. So for instance, a watershed. Um, would be a great example of that, or, or a valley or a mountain system. And, and, and then can we, in seeing these spaces differently and how they operate, both internally, but also operate with the systems that touch them and, and border against them, can we make better decisions as stewards of our environment and our communities? And so that has been really powerful to me because that's also helped me see deepening connections with the North and, and, and the East for us. Um, I think for many, many years, Maine suffered from kind of Boston and New York envy. Um, we were characterized as being kind of the end of the line, you know, the northeast corner of. Um, what I've seen now through this work and, and re-envisioning how we see ourselves is we can be a front door to so much activity, both, you know, inviting people in to Maine from the north and the east, but also uh, sending ourselves out and our experience out to make those connections. So that, that bioregional approach where I'm not seeing the world as Maine, uh, necessarily Quebec, Nova Scotia, but I'm seeing it through this bio, biology or biosphere lens has been really helpful. And then what uh, Ingen and Alice were saying earlier, you know, another thing that I've learned in my work with Glenn is, is looking at the world, we, we are very attuned at looking at the world at a, through what we would think of as a, as a mental microscope that's very close to us, what is very adjacent to us, and then what's very far away, telescopic, right? We've we got really great telescopes that can tell us what's really far away. And one of the things that we've been working on in our, in our work is, is how do we think of a macroscope, something that lives in between, that allows us to build those connections from what is very close to us what is our backyard? What is our garden? What is uh, you know uh, the pond that's that's adjacent to me, or you know this like, and see those ripple effects, and then move into that macroscope, and that's where some of our great work can happen. So that's a little bit of, of kind of how I, I see my work being informed. Thank you for calling me an artist. I think that's really funny. My dad will think it's hilarious based on my artistic <laughs> skills, um, uh, but I am a writer, and I've been a writer for a very long time. Um, and, you know, my background is in the humanities and, and my family is deeply seated in the arts. My brother is a theater director in New York and a professor. My dad is still painting. Um, so it's part of our DNA. And so I've kind of found a way to express it, I guess. Yeah. So that's Absolutely. great. Thank you for recognizing that. I do. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's interesting, too, within the field of visual art, you know, of course, there's this wide area of what we call post-studio practice. Mm -hmm. And I do think that, you know, the kind of interpersonal connections that you are just so creative with and so dedicated to making, the way that you intersect and speak so easily with artists, um, I think people feel... You know, people feel like their creativity is heightened around you, and I think that's 
fantastic. Aww. And um, <laughs> to me, you know, what you're saying about these kind of like biosphere areas is such a great example of that because it shows you thinking like, um, you know, in this, you know, very expansive way about what it means to inhabit a place and to experience it. So that's great, Holly. Thanks. Um, so I would say um, being out in certain places and just landscape um, certainly influences how I work, um, whether it's going for walks and just observing and um, taking something from that time, like compositionally into the studio. Um, I think I draw a lot, like a, my palette or colors from these moments, but um, mostly I think it's like just being out somewhere and living and finding these moments that feel significant and wanting to almost expand upon them or like spend more time in these moments through creating works. Mm -hmm. um, so creating paintings, and I think that's where the narrative aspect can come in um, and that there maybe was a moment or a time that felt significant or where I felt grounded or where I didn't feel grounded or where I felt something, some emotion that um, I want to revisit. And you can, I can do that through spending more time with it, through creating something that in some way is related or embodies that. Um, and so the narrative aspect can be if I'm literally like creating, you know, a time where my family was doing something and I'm painting that or a time where I was in this specific place and I'm kind of recreating that and often I do that from memory it's um I like painting that way a lot and a lot of the paintings in the show are kind of draw from that it's not like specific photo references from places but it's often just like from a feeling or a memory of a place that um, I work from later um, so it's not always totally realistic in that way, but um, yeah. Yeah, and do you, you know, Alice, you were saying before that you're originally from Tennessee. Do you feel like um, maybe being anchored in another region, can you see that influencing or changing what you make at all as a creative person? Yes. Um, yeah, thinking about that question, I think it goes both ways, where I think it definitely would, if I were somewhere else, other than Maine, it would certainly influence my work because I'm always going out and drawing upon the places around me in mm. works, whether it's, like I said, like the ocean or the snow or the cold or the, you know, whatever, the woods, whatever I'm feeling and seeing around me. Um, so if I was in a different place, then that would have to be different to a degree. Um, but I would be working still in that similar way, I think. So in that way, right. perhaps it's the same. It's really hard yeah. to know. Um, yeah, it's really hard to know, but I think I can think about other places where I have lived and where I've worked, um, mainly being Tennessee. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when I'm thinking about Tennessee, it's a lot more, like, the works that come from that are often more like family-based or more like tied in with nostalgia or right. childhood or yeah. these other elements that are maybe less like yeah, drawing from those kind of feels instead of just like what's around me here in Maine and the feelings and things that I'm going through now in this place. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's hard to know. I think wherever I am, like I very much embed the experiences I'm having and like <laughs> what I'm going through and the interactions I have with people and who's in my life at the time and just everything that's happening is very much like I then intertwine with the environment and like the places I spend time in. Right. So I, it would have to change if I go somewhere else. Well, um, it's interesting too, because I think what I hear you saying is that your work is a lot, it has a lot to do with observation um, of your environment and kind of openness to a sort of recording process, but that it's also really anchored in memory. And um, there are these resonances that come, you know, to you from, from past experience. Um, I think one interesting thing about what you're doing is like how it really does kind of inhabit this place of record keeping. Um, mm -hmm. I think that we both made a painting um, 
last year that was right after the German yes, meteor shower. I, um, I I'm I think I forgot to introduce myself. I'm the, I'm the director of the UNE um, art galleries, <laughs> Hillary Irons. Um, I'm also a painter. Um, and Alice and I had sort of coincidentally mm -hmm. both felt like we just wanted to record this meteor shower mm -hmm. and. Um, my Geminids and your Geminids are very, very different, but there is this sense of wanting to, to fix this place-based experience um, in memory, um, sort of on a surface, as something that's legible to people with a visual language that kind of transcends mm -hmm. a verbal language. And I think that has so much to do with like the sensibility of a place um, and how the place feels and what it's like to move through it. So. Um, yeah, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. That's wonderful. Yeah, everything you just said. <laughs> <laughs> you said it very well, so I agree wholeheartedly. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Alice. Well, I spend a lot of time observing, like you do. Um, I feel that most of my work that goes into a painting is the observing process. Um, you know, out in nature, walking, running, whatever. Um, and then I try to s drip away as much as I can and be left with the essence, like the feeling. Um, back to these barns so of mine, when I started to do barn share, I always, I basically grew up in my grandfather's barn. That's where <laughs> I spent my whole childhood. So there's always been a fascination for that. Um, so when I started painting these barns here, they were, looked very different. Um, and as I mentioned, I drove around, talked to people, the stories became a huge part of each painting. And then I realized that while well, Maine and Norway, or actually it's universal, right? A barn people take, it's the future, it's your crop, it's your livelihood. So what people put into these buildings were just, um, Crazy, great. <laughs> People are so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm talking my way into this. This is great. No, what you're saying is wonderful. Um, so yeah, I just realized that there are more th that connects us, you know, than divides us, even in such a simple structure as a barn. So the barn for me became like a symbol of something that connects us. Yeah, um, absolutely. I feel the same way about wooden boats. Right? So, so just the same thing. I know. Same I used thing. to own a wooden boat. There you go. Two tons of mahogany. Yes. Do you know how much work <laughs> that was? It's a lot. It's, it's a lot. And you know what they say about boats. It's a hole in the ocean that you throw your wallet into. So I know. <laughs> I know. But they're beautiful. So they say lots of say boats. <laughs> So, you know, it's really interesting, too, Ingen, about what you're saying is that I feel like it connects right back to what Holly was talking about, about this sort of like active way of moving through the world mm -hmm. and perceiving, you know, both the land, but also the other people that are um, with you in this sphere, right? Um, you have these, this really beautiful way of talking about how um, the activity of daily life is very integrated for you with the activity of painting. Mm -hmm. um, the way yes. that you move your body through a space. You've talked about gardens and meadows. Um, the architecture that you are influenced by is, you know, it's your home and it's the sort of like the architecture of the barn where the idea is to balloon out this interior space to yeah. fill with abundance of some kind. Greater than the painting. It's again, it's people's future livelihood. Mm -hmm. um, it's all in the barn. It's in the barn, <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. And, the and craftsmanship. it's craftsmanship. Yeah, the craftsmanship, but also the innovation that yeah. goes into it. And that's a, you yeah. know, I feel like for me, like that's another touch point here that's really important is mm. kind of the really innovative way that the three of you are approaching. Um, you know, the idea of kind of moving through the North Atlantic region creatively and really um, inhabiting that experience. So um, I think, Ingen, it's really interesting for me to think about your paintings, how um, they have this kind of, um, you know, this kind of, I was saying a, that they, ha they sort of inhabit this sense of tranquility and anticipation. They have this kind of classicizing impulse, but you know, they're also, it's just such a radical way to think about them as like just contiguous with um, the action of daily life, which you also bring this kind of very creative energy to. So mm -hmm. you're sort of practicing your art across all these, um, you know, 
embodied disciplines. I love that. Thank you. It's wonderful. Um, and you have made the very important point that you feel more of a sense of connection than difference across regions. Do you feel like, let's just imagine, for example, that you move to a very far away place, Australia or something. Can you just like think your way into maybe how, like what that would feel like for you as an artist? If that would influence my work? Um, yeah. I didn't think so until last week. <laughs> and I just mentioned it to you. So, you know, I paint the way I do. I've been thinking, would I always paint like that? And then I spent a week in Georgia, which I mean, it's not a, Australia, but it's <laughs> um, basically by myself. I lived on a beach for a week and I just, you know, walked from sunrise to sunset and it was just beautiful and peaceful and everything I embrace. And then I found myself actually asked, you know, uh, looking through some of the questions and I thought, wow, my paintings are different. <laughs> they are Georgia. <laughs> And I never thought that that, that would happen. Mm -hmm. But so clearly, yes, if I moved to Australia or... Yeah. That was just my extreme example. For but you. I didn't <laughs> even realize it, that, you know, the colors were different. The, mm. There were more details on the beach. There, it was just... And I enjoyed it. Yeah, it's well, wonderful. And when we were having that conversation earlier, <laughs> I was sharing the story of my dad's yeah. painting. So my father right? is a maritime artist, and he focuses his work in Maine. Um, on historic ships, and uh, he maybe I've influenced him over the last several years, I don't know, but he decided to actually do a painting of the Arctic schooner Bowden in the Arctic, which really freaked him out. So I was home at Christmas, and he decided to do this thing, and my dad paints very whimsical scenes, so, you know, the polar bears are nice, and they're getting up on the ship to help, not to eat them, and things like that, but um, he has a background illustration, but he said, oh my God, is this too much blue? because he was painting icebergs and, and ocean and sky and it was so blue and it was like nothing he had painted before when he paints the main landscape behind these, uh, these ships that he paints. So it was, it was really interesting that, you know, he, got, he had his out-of-body experience by trying to p paint in the Arctic and it was great. I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, and I didn't get a narwhal. I asked for a narwhal, but he said, he said that would be too much. So I'm probably. next time I want an R wall. Yeah. Well, the kind of cool thing about what you're saying, Holly, is how your father was able to kind of inhabit that place without actually traveling there, right? Yeah. Um, and that's, I think, the power that we're experiencing as creative people is the ability to inhabit a place and sink into it um, with the kind of intentionality that Ingen and Alice are pointing to, but also to, you know, to use the imaginative um, mind to... to yeah move through space in a way that's not literal. Yeah, I mean, yeah. He's, he's a crazy historian, so any painting he does, he, he, he researches impeccably for the human experience. So he was reading about Peary and Macmillan and, and the experiences on that ship. Um, I actually pointed him in the Maine's Women's Writers Collection to the Peary Papers, which was really cool. Um, and he does that work, and then he goes all the way down to the microscopic. So he's, he's researching rigging to make sure things are mm -hmm. in the right place. Um, so yeah, so he's, he's a mad historian. He's never been to the Arctic. I don't think he has any desire to go to the Arctic. Uh, he's more of a warm, warm weather guy than that. But, but he's uh, sort of been there. He's sort of been there. Yeah. He's head he has. <laughs> um, did you tell him it was too blue or did you say no, it was No, I said it was beautiful. I said that's, that's yeah. it. You, did, you nailed it. And he, he was a little incredulous, but uh, the painting is now on display in Washington, D.C. And uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful piece. And uh, so it, it was definitely a, a stretch for him, which was really cool. That's fantastic. Um, all right. Well, it's, it's just so wonderful to hear um, the very specific um, perspective that each one of you is bringing to this, these questions, as well as the overlap, this kind of like, you know, um, overlap of the psyche where you're able to like, f kind of feel your way into a creative connection with your, your landscape, but also, you know, the people involved, the architecture, um, the act of moving from place to place. Um, and you all bring such a unique voice to the conversation um, based on what your experiences are what you, and what you value, you know, like what you choose to, to take in. Um, so my last question for you is, again, it's kind of related more to Holly's father's experiment, um, painting the Arctic landscape. But um, if you could travel to a new place within the North Atlantic region um, that you've never been to before, but you've always heard about, or return to a place that you have been to before, 
um, where would it be? And what do you think might be unique and exciting about that place? What kind of histories might it hold? And what would you hope to discover there? Um, so uh, I'm hoping, um, and President Herbert's here, so this is my wish list. Uh, no, um, so I, I would very much, the, the, two, the two areas, I, I, I'm very lucky to have traveled quite a bit through the North Atlantic. I think the two areas I'm most interested in visiting um, right now are Greenland um, and the Faroe Islands. And, and I love the, the, from what I have learned through my research, but not being there, is the incredible uh, scrappiness, innovation, and connection to nature and environment that these communities have used to carve out places and ca carve out lives in very somewhat inhospitable places. And the rich tradition, particularly of indigeneity in Greenland, and to be there at a time where they are writing their own constitution. I mean, what an historic moment, you know? And, and so to be able to be there and respectfully listen and observe that process, um, that would be incredible. You know, I, w I would love to see that uh, kind of a birth of a, of a, of a nation in its, in its, it, as it happens. I think that would be fantastic. Um, so hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, that I'll get to one of those two places soon. And I love how you're bringing the human connection aspect into it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, that's, that's what so it's about beautiful. for me. I mean, it's, it's about, so, you know, yes, I, you know, I have a, I work in sustainability science, I guess if you're going to call it that, but um, what's amazing about the work is it's about people and it's about how we engage with our place and how we steward that place forward and the belief that we as human beings can make choices for our human communities that are also beneficial for a thriving environment around us and that we are deeply interconnected as human beings and deeply connected as human beings with our ecosystems. And so that's a lived experience. That, and, and there are so many of these communities in the North Atlantic that have that experience and that cultural history of connectivity to place that I think that's the key to unlocking a lot of the things that we need to move forward in a more sustainable way in, in the North Atlantic and here in Maine, very locally. I mean, these are the things we do when I work with kids. This is the stuff we, you know, we talk about, little kids. Um, so yeah, so that, that to me is really inspiring. It's about the people of the place and, and the place of the people. If you're gonna reverse it. Thank you. That's great. All right. Um, I'll join you to the Faroe Islands. All right. <laughs> that's uh, yeah. That's probably at the top of my list um, because you know the beauty of the nature. I want to talk to the people. How how is it to be there? Um, I. Google through every photo I can find, so <laughs> I'm well prepared. Um, go back to a place I've been before. I would definitely go back to Iceland, which is probably the most beautiful country I've ever been to. Um, we, you know, since I go back and north, uh, back and forth to Norway quite often. Iceland, Reykjavik is where we always transit. And I'd been there, I don't know how many times I've been there, but I'd never actually been outside of the airport, which is stupid. So we <laughs> <laughs> did that a few years ago and it was just this epiphany. Yeah. Like, whoa, I knew it was beautiful, but that was just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, and I just felt very connected, maybe because, you know, the way I paint, um, I always like to strip away a lot in my paintings and I felt that I walked into this <laughs> country that was stripped to the bare bone. It is, yeah. um, and the people were, as you said, you know, you drive through these landscapes and then you enter a town and you're so welcomed. Mm -hmm. It's just the coolest people. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's so, so wonderful. Yeah. All right, so we'll go to the Faroes and then head back through Iceland. I will. It's close, right? <laughs> now, just for the benefit of our audience, I was just looking, um, to see about the Faroe Islands? Because I feel like I don't know very much about them. Can one of you hop in and just kind of give us a little five second you? overview? So the Faroe Islands are uh, a, a territory of Denmark. Um, They're located sort of kind of uh, north of Scotland. Between, yeah, yeah kind of between kind of Iceland, Scotland mm -hmm. and Norway. Um, and it, 
again, the same, about the same population as Greenland, although Greenland is geographically massive. Um, we're talking about 60,000 people. Um, and uh, really interesting history of uh, whaling, subsistence whaling, subsistence mm -hmm. fishing, subsistence hunting, um, that um, has a lot of current now collisions with issues of pollution and things, things of that nature. I had the benefit of working on a COVID-19 project with some colleagues that were in the Faroe Islands, and it was fascinating to watch how they dealt with COVID in the Faroes because of their ability to close borders, but also their ability through their healthcare system to track how the virus was moving through their community. Uh, it was just, it's an amazing place. And, and yeah, I'm just, I'm fascinated by it. Fascinated by it. And it's so incredibly lush. Oh my gosh. We're being it's so green. It it's so green. It's this green <laughs> emerald in the middle of a- and sheep everywhere. Yeah, and sheep. Stone houses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right, now I know where I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'd like to join. I think uh, it's a fun question. I would like to go everywhere. Um, I think Norway has been somewhere that I've dreamed about going since like I first learned about fjords and <laughs> geography in seventh grade. Um, and one of my, a painter I really love, Nikolai Astrup, is from there and his works um, are of that region and like the small village where he farmed and lived. And I think I fell in love with those paintings and thus kind of that part of Norway as well. Um, that's kind of like a wildest dream. <laughs> one day, hopefully in my life, I'll go there. Um, okay. <laughs> sounds great um yeah i think for places returning to and like a more um realistic soon on the timeline um trip i love the like remote island communities here in maine mm. yeah um so yeah something so special and different from other places i've been um i've spent time on isla ho most summers i spend I go there not for very long, but um, spend some time. And I think, yeah, I'm just so interested in the, it's like fewer than 100 people live there. Um, and it's 11 miles or so off Stonington, Deer Isle. Um, and it's such an incredible community. It's like everyone seems to have a role and they're all connected and very much like it's, I'm so interested by how that community is like, completely intertwined with the landscape and their environment and it's remote and like relatively secluded um obviously there's the ferry going back and forth every day the mail boat but yeah i'm just so interested by that way of living it's so different than my life in portland and there's something so beautiful about that community and like um yeah relationship with the landscape and the ocean and each other, the other people living on that island and um, the islands around. And yeah, I think I would, I've always wanted to just go and spend a while <laughs> out there and just like learn more um, about what it's like to live out there and um, why people do live out there. Um, yeah. That's wonderful, yeah. And I think that points back to the idea that um, you know, there's a sense of connectivity in the landscape that is, um, you know, reinforced by connections to the land and the community, but also reinforced by distance and isolation sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that can be, you know, to a, a certain degree, that can be something that people choose to participate in um, if, they're, if they have the, the resources to choose that. So right. um, I think, you know, what you're saying about Isla Ho is so wonderful because it does have this sense of, you know, otherworldliness just because of that little bit of extra distance mm -hmm. from Stonington um, and you know the, the effort that you have to put in to get there and you know I love too how that connects back to something that you Ingen were saying at the beginning about how just you know the activity of moving through your daily life and doing these things and walking and running and you know breathing the air and looking up at you know where the trees and the sky intersect like all of that is you know influencing what you do creatively and it's it's part of a creative action so i like how you're kind of imagining your way into that <laughs> Ilaho community which is so specific you know um <laughs> yeah. 
This is wonderful. Well, thank you all so much. That was great. It was so wonderful to hear you talk. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions for our <laughs> panelists? Thank you, that was really interesting. And, and I live on an island, by the way, so I love Haiti. <laughs> <laughs> it's not remote like I love, but once you're on an island, it doesn't really yeah. matter if you're surrounded mm -hmm. by water. But, um, so Alice, you talked about um, painting from memory, and, and I think it sounds like you sort of do something similar in that you boil things down to the essence, but it was so fascinating to hear about how you sometimes knock on the door and get <laughs> people's stories. And, I'm curious if they, did, are they interested in follow-up? Like, do they want to see your work afterwards? Do they want to feel like their barn has inspired your work? <laughs> and have you ever kept that connection going? Yeah, well, um, one of my shows, um, the barn looked a little different then. Um, I found this old dairy farm, not actually not far from me. Um, so I, it's, I'd been driving by it and it was dilapidated, which I thought was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, so I rang the doorbell and this super, super sweet old gentleman came out and he was just so lovely and he just lost his wife and all her penis were, you know, blossoming and so we had like hours of conversation and he, it was clearly not a dairy farm anymore, he took care of retired racehorses <laughs> and, you know, the barn swallows were flying in and out and the roofs were falling and it, what he just saw, you know, things falling apart where I saw beauty. So um, I did a whole show around his farm. Uh, and then the day before opening day, I headed over and I gave him, you know, a few invitations because I really want him to be there. But he didn't come. Um, w when I gave him the invitations, you know, he started to, Aww. he was so moved that I actually saw beauty because it was, to him, it was just a lot of work. <laughs> but he did show up the day after oh. because he was too embarrassed that his dilapidated barn was on, you yeah. know, but it did come. Oh, that's so, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, we kept in touch since. <laughs> that's so fantastic. <laughs> that's Thanks. That was such a great question, Beth. I love that. Um, Anybody else? Kate, <laughs> you're like in front. Um, well, I am so grateful to all of you. Thank you. And I do think that it's important, too, to think a little bit about what Holly said. You um, continue to intentionally and sensitively redirect the conversation back to indigenous communities and to, um, you know, to highlight the fact that, you know, the places that you've traveled to, the different regions of the North Atlantic, um, do have indigenous communities that have been settled. And, you know, we are, are also on indigenous land here. Um, the Wabanaki Federation um, is the sort of original group. Um, and I just think that, you know, to me the main theme that's kind of coming up in structuring this conversation is this sense of, um, you know, not just the land as like a landscape with an ocean and like a certain, you know, set of, um, you know, botanical specimens, but also something that people live through and in and that history is really part of it. And I love how all of you are, you know, speaking to these different kinds of histories. You're talking about this um, gentleman with the barn and that's like this really particular, like the history of a family and a building having this like personality that can be um, kind of reimagined. You're thinking about, you know, memory and recording sort of coming up to, you know, inhabit a landscape in a narrative way. I mean, it's really beautiful to hear the way you talk about that, Alice. And then, Holly, I just have so much respect for the way that you, you know, you meet people way that, where they are and you listen to what people say and you kind of feel your way into those worlds and it makes the world so much bigger and richer. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.